This is a CPU, it's sitting in your motherboard somewhere, in your computer. You give CPUs some instructions, some code that looks like this. Back to back, you just tell it what to do and it does it like a machine, man, it's crazy. Step by step, you know, that's how it gets things done. Most interesting thing about it is you can say, only do things if other things are true. Like we can say, if somebody pressed a button, do another thing. It's a whole world, you can get a degree in it if you want, whatever. To understand this video, you gotta know what's going on with this. I'm just taking it for granted that you know how to program. This is a GPU, very different. It's what's called specialized. It's essentially another computer sitting next to your CPU that's very good at doing many things in parallel. What does that even mean? There's this website, shadertoy.com, where you can write a program. This looks like code, but actually this code will run for every single pixel on its output. For example, we can write a program that just outputs 1001, which in RGBA is just red. This UV variable is defined to be 0 all the way on the left and 1 all the way on the right. If we compile that, you can see it's going to be black all the way on the left and red all the way on the right because for every single pixel, this function is running and it's deciding that the color is going to be red so much so that the UV, the X coordinate of that UV variable, is positive. This is fine and dandy, but there's another half to 3D graphics that's not just what color are the pixels. As I'm sure you might be aware of, 3D things are made of polygons and triangles. Uh, they are defined by vertices, which are just points in 3D space in a certain order. For example, what's happening here in this shader I kind of ported and turned into being made of triangles. The surface of this ocean is made of little tiny triangles. And two things are happening powered by the GPU over here. There's a function that runs per pixel, like I just showed you in Shader Toy, that decides what color things are. There's also a function per vertex that decides where things are, right? So it can kind of take in a 3D model that looks like this and deform it with a program that you can write in that language, right? Little side note, the GPU accomplishes this by having a hundred tiny uh, CPUs, which are less uh, powerful and more primitive, but it's got a lot of them, so it does a lot of them in parallel. Every frame, it's kind of doing huge batches of pixels and vertex transformations, uh, just all at the same time, right? As opposed to your CPU, which is usually doing like 8 or 16 things, right? That's so many cores your CPU has, so many things it's doing at the same time. GPUs can have like hundreds of cores. So that's the basics of 3D graphics. We're just trying to write programs that move things where we want them to be and make them the colors that we want them to be, right? And we're going to do a quick review of what's called linear algebra. Big, scary words, simple concepts. A matrix is a grid of numbers, like literally, it's like four numbers by four numbers to make 16 numbers. Now keep in mind, I'm going to give you the programmer, game developer, cartoon model of this subject that's not very good if you want to be world class. But if you want to be mediocre, I'm here for you. You can just kind of think about this as a function that takes in a 3D point and outputs a 3D point, right? Don't worry about how, unless you want to be really good. If you want to be really good, go read a book or watch 3 Blue and Brown. Anyways, this is a 3D point 101. You know, if this is the X coordinate, this is the Y coordinate, this is the Z coordinate, then this would be 1 on the X coordinate, right? It would be 0 on the Y coordinate and 1 on the Z coordinate. So that point would be about right here. You get what's going on in here, right? 3D points. Matrices actually move 3D points in a special way, such that where the points end up is consistent with another smaller coordinate system, right? Don't worry, I'm going to go straight to a visual example. So this is a cube in Blender right? You can move it around in 3D space and it's got 3D coordinate. You can see as we move along the X, the X coordinate increases, right? Here I've just made a sphere and what I'm going to do in Blender is parent this sphere to this cube. So what that means is as I move this cube, the sphere kind of moves along with it, right? I can scale this and even rotate it and like it, the sphere is kind of in the coordinate system of this cube. Now if you imagine the cube as its own little coordinate axis, you can kind of see what I mean, right? The sphere is it's at 0, 0, 1 relative to that little cube, but because it's relative to something, as I move the cube where it actually is in the world space, right? Kind of like the thing that we're looking at is different. When that cube is over here, the sphere is actually, you know, it's at like y is like 5, x is like 5. It's still at 1 in this case, but even if I move the cube up, now how high up is different, right? It's moving relative to this thing. Where, it, where something is and how it's rotated and how it's scaled is called a transform. It's literally just how something is transformed. And it's defined by a matrix, right? 16 numbers. Now, you've already been watching me use transforms. As I move around this cube, you see these vertices, they're moving with the cube. What's up with that, right? The cube is kind of, I'm moving one point around, right? I'm moving a point in 3D space, but all the vertices are kind of following it. That's because what I'm changing is a transform that's then being applied to all of the vertices, right? Now, how is a transform of, like, describing where the cube is, it takes in points relative and it outputs points relative to the world. What I mean by that is if I put in the point 000, 
Like if you look at where this cube is, 000 is right on that dot, so it would output where that dot is in world, in the world, right? And so that's how we can draw all the points in the cube, right? If these vertices are specified relative to the cube, we just apply its transform to those vertices, right? We put those vertices which are relative to the cube into the transform and we get out points relative to the world and then we draw, right? So you can actually rotate transforms and then the same logic still applies. We're putting in points relative to the cube. We're getting out points relative to the world. So transforms literally transform points between spaces, right? They make points which are relative to one thing relative to another thing. So in math, in functions in general, just expect certain types of things to be input and then certain types of things will be output. The type of thing uh, an object's transform expects is a point relative to that object. And then it outputs something that's relative to the world, right? Which means we can actually stack multiple transforms together. If we go back to this little uh, example here, so here I've parented one of like the cube transform thingamabobs to itself, right? And the same thing that we saw with it in the sphere is still happening, right? I just did it again, so now there's three of them, right? Let me show you some cool stuff you can do with this. I can rotate the bottom one that rotates them all. Then I rotate this one, that's only the top one. And finally, I can rotate this one, right? So we've already created something that's just kind of interesting, right? I'm going to explain exactly what's going on here. So there's three transforms going on here, right? There's the base transform, right? And there's the other two transforms. And they're being applied in an order. I'm going to show you how this works out. Remember, I want you to think about this in terms of what's input and what's output, right? The input to T1 is a thing local to cube 1. What's output is a thing local to the world. Now for T2, it's a little different, right? Because this parent-child relationship, where it's kind of like attached to T1, that means that what its transform means is different, right? So its input is still the same. It takes in a thing local to cube 2, right? But it actually outputs things local to, T to cube 1. Which means that the output of T2 can be plugged into the input of T1, right? Like, like a blocks, right? As input, it expects things local to cube 2. And with how we've defined things here, it outputs things local to T1, which means it can be plugged right into T1, which expects things local to T1, and then outputs things in the world. And then that's how this is being drawn onto the screen right now. These vertices are local to T2. First, they go through T2, right? Things local to Q2. Now they're local to T1, so they're passed back into T1, right? Finally, they're in the world, and then we know how to draw 3D points in the world. They essentially work just like this. There's not much more you need to sit down and implement the, this yourself if you already know how to program. So just a quick uh, aside, if you're interested in getting 3D data to work with, this Blender Expert Scripting Guide is what I followed in order to get everything you see here working. This is all written in an engine from scratch, loading the data from Blender, right? You can see the 3D animations are working, right? What I'm going to share with you will let you do this. But I, I highly recommend something like this in order to get 3D data to work with. It just kind of explains things clearly. You can poke around in Blender with Python. Right, so the remaining key concepts to do this. This is what's called an armature in Blender. If you fuss around with it, you'll notice it behaves exactly like those parented things that we just made. So each bone must be having its own transform, where it takes in points relative to that bone and outputs things relative to like the parent of that bone. For the root bone, that's the world, right? But for this bone, it's its, it's, its immediate parent. And you can actually define animations as how these bones, which are moved relative to each other, move over time. So the key thing to realize here is that these bones are moving these vertices in the same way that those objects were kind of moving each other, right? So this skeleton, this armature, all the bones have a rest pose, right? It's where they were just kind of placed initially. And remember, our goal here is just to move the vertices such that they're kind of animated like a person. In order to accomplish this, we need to take these skeletons, which we can get from sites like Mixamo. Mixamo is an excellent library of kind of like clip art animations. You can just kind of pretty easily apply to your 3D characters to get these bone movement data, right? So going back to our little lesson about how transforms can kind of plug into each other if the types that are expected match, right? It might seem at first that we already know how to do 3D animation now because if we have the transforms for all of these bones, right, and, and we can just say, you know, okay, first we plug it into this bone, then this one, then this one, then we should be done maybe, right? Because we already know how to do that. There's a small problem though. This expects points that are local to Q3. But let's say we want to go and transform this vertex in the vertex shader. It's not local to that bone. It's actually local to the model right? Which is just in the wrong space, so we can't do that. 
In order to successively apply each of these bones transforms, we need some kind of matrix which takes as input points relative to the model, and then outputs points relative to a specific bone, each one of these bones, right? One other small detail. Right, in order to do uh in order to do this properly, each one of these points is actually influenced by more than one bone. But if you can understand points being absolutely moved by one bone, then it's just you like you just do this process multiple times and you 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 wait the outcome, right? So this is the vertex shader that's doing that. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because I think it's pretty straightforward. Don't worry about this junk, this is just to get it working for the web because this game is targeting the web. This is the important line of code. Essentially, we wanna to get to a point where each bone just has one matrix in the vertex shader that we're multiplying. The model space of vertex by, right, this position in, right, we're given in these position ins, these little points that are relative to the model. And so all we do is each point can have up to four bones that influence it and then they have a weight, right? So like, we can visualize this here in Blender. This top vertex might be influenced by this bone by let's say 0.8, this bone by 0.2, and this bone by zero. You just do the process we're describing, but for each bone, and then you literally add up its position by that weight, like, so each bone kind of matters less in the final summed position. The small digression, the key thing that we need right now is some way to take points relative to the model and make them points relative to a specific bone. So in Blender, in this like edit post thing, we actually already have that. Each one of these bones already has a transform that says where it is. And that transform, right, is one of those puzzle pieces that takes points in one space and puts them into another space. It takes points of one kind and makes them into another kind. Right, these things actually take in a point local to the bone and outputs a point local, a point local to the model. Now hold on a second, something about transforms and mathematical functions in general is they can have an inverse, right? We can actually invert this matrix. Again, a special mathematical operation you don't need to know the details of to be a game developer like this high level, right? Bind pose or the rest pose of the bones specifies several transforms, which you can access in Blender like this. They take in points local to the bone, so for example, 0, 0 would be right there, and output points local to the model, right? The inverse of that, or the inverse bind pose matrix, does the opposite. You take in points relative to the model, and you output points relative to the specific bone. Why is this useful? Because remember, for the bone transforms, the like outermost transform expects things local to that thing, right? So let's say in the vertex shader, we want to transform this vertex by this bone and its weight is like 0.8 or something, right? Then the matrix you multiply it by is going to have to be, well, first of all, it's going to have to take in a point relative to the model, right? So what we need is we need the inverse bind pose transform for that specific bone. And then you can change transforms together by just multiplying the matrices, right? And so we just chain in T3, T2, T1 to get a thing local to so it was the world in here, but in this case, it's gonna be local to the model. So you can just take all these matrices and like on the CPU in your program, multiply them together, then pass them to the vertex shader. Literally just multiply the vertex by that matrix and then bam, there you go, it'll move, right? The one extra hiccup is as they animate across time, you're gonna have two different keyframes that specify for each one of these bones. They're like animated pose in the, in terms of offset, a rotation and a scale. The rotation will be in the form of a quaternion. Don't worry about what that is. It just makes it so that as you kind of animate them over time, they aren't screwed up, right? If you have Euler angles like XYZ, when you animate them, they get screwed up. So you just lerp the position and scale, and then you slurp the quaternion. It's the same thing as lerping, but again, as you like move it across time, it won't get screwed up. It'll do the thing that you expect it to do in terms of rotation, which is go right there. Like take the closest path along the sphere, kind of. So with that, you should have everything you need to begin implementing this. Just think about this a lot, practice. I'm gonna give you the list in which you should do these things. This is the order that I implemented these things in my engine, and I had a lot of success. I never really had any hard issues that were like impossible to debug for a while. John Cromick has this quote, little tiny steps using local information winds up leading to all the best answers. What this means is don't try to do big jumps because then you often get lost, right? In this quote, he was speaking of success in terms of an analogy with something called gradient descent, which if you don't understand, this isn't helpful, so ignore it. But this is some sage advice here, right? He's seen a lot of successful people, so he understands what's going on. You gotta look immediately around you, what are the problems that I have? And then you gotta solve them with what you have, right? Local information, tiny steps, you do a lot of them and you get something. So here are the tiny local steps you should do to implement scalable animation. First thing, get the buying pose transforms in your program and debug visualize them with lines. And then make sure it just looks correct and make some models, try to screw with it, right? This took me about a day. 
and that's what these lines that you see are. So these are actually the like animated posed lines, but uh, do it for just the bind pose first. Next, you're going to want to take the inverse of the bind pose transforms, which remember is what gets you for every single vertex. It's what allows you to move that vertex into that bone's local coordinate system. So then like the bone's animated transform can be applied correctly in a chain all the way down and the bones pose transforms for any animation, right? Apply them one after another and make sure the debug lines look correct. Again, this is still, you're not worrying about uh, weighting of the vertices, right? Do this, make sure the debug lines are correct. This took me about another day or two. And then now final, serialize and deserialize the weights, the bonuses, and transform the armature, right? So this is actually the same code as step two up here, right? But you're just doing it on the GPU here with vertices instead of debug lines. This is very, very good because now you're kind of working with code that should work on the same, should work the same way. Like the jump from CPU to GPU is already hard enough. So making sure that you're able to working the CPU is a nice trick to make that easier. Finally, just animate the matrices, right? You kind of, this should be the easiest part of this, right? You're just kind of LARPing between two frames over time. And then that's it. You've got scalable animations. It really is not that bad in my opinion. I'll have some helpful links in the description if you want code examples and just further references. The game that this is all for, Dante's Cowboy, is going to be releasing this fall. Go ahead and wishlist it now, it's in the description.